Hi everyone, my name is Misal Vitan. I'm a fellow in residence here at the Shalom Park and Institute of North America. Uh, and it's really my pleasure and privilege to welcome everyone and thank you all for coming for what is bound to be uh, a really exciting and lively conversation. Uh, let me tell you how tonight's uh, panel and conversation really came about. Um, earlier this year, I kept having moments in which I felt very disoriented and even lonely uh, as an American Jew who felt committed both to Zionism and to liberal values. And this disorientation uh, kept coming at me from different angles. On the one hand, you know, reading about news coming uh, from Israel, it felt like Israel uh, as a Zionist a Jewish state uh, is becoming a place where public opinion is increasingly hostile to certain liberal values. Some examples of, of events that happened to, to make some of us feel this way might be the passing of the nation state law, uh, rising right wing sentiment uh, in Israel, the growing alignment between the Netanyahu and the Trump government, uh, or just the lack of, uh, of very visible public advocacy for religious pluralism, the kind that American uh, Jews uh, care for. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, when thinking about liberal and progressive spaces in America, it feels like these spaces are also increasingly uh, hostile towards Zionism. Uh, we can talk about social justice activists who decided to center anti-Zionism as a key feature of their intersectional work. Uh, college campuses where we've seen a, a rise in BDS campaigns and anti-normalization efforts uh, to not have any dialogue uh, with Zionists or proponents of the Jewish state. Uh, or just generally uh, an assumption that Zionism equals racism and that Zionists uh, cannot be trusted to maintain liberal or progressive credentials uh, while still being uh, openly Zionist. So on the one hand, on the one hand having um, uh, Israel as a, uh, uh, you know, as a place where we have uh, less liberalism or, or, or more hostility towards liberalism, and then on the other hand in America, uh, more hostility towards uh, Zionism is actually creating uh, a difficult space for individuals who are trying to honor and to hold on to both commitments. And I would say that the challenge is not only one in which we might feel lonely or disoriented or politically homeless, but this challenge and really what we're going to talk about tonight a lot is that it brings really difficult ethical and moral questions that liberal Zionists have to grapple with. Uh, for example, the question of what does it mean when we continue advocating for Zionism based on a vision of liberal Zionism, when that vision is increasingly not aligned with our reality on the ground. Uh, or a question, um, do some of us uh, tolerate or accept what might be problematic anti-Zionist forms of sentiment to maintain liberal or progressive credentials? These are difficult questions, um, and, uh, and it's really why we're convening tonight. Uh, I was lucky enough when I was struggling with these questions to, uh, to approach Yehuda uh, and say, you know, I need uh, help thinking together through this. And he invited me to convene this conversation, uh, to really be able to make this a more public conversation, to, to grapple together uh, and ask big questions. Um, so tonight's panel, we're going to hear from, uh, you have the full bios, you know, in your seats, but we're going to hear from Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer, who's the president of the Shalom Hartman uh, Institute of North America, uh, Dr. Shana Weiss, the associate director of the Shusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University, uh, and Dr. Michael Kaplow, Policy Director of the Israel Policy Forum. Uh, we're going to have a conversation that's gonna last about an hour, and then we're going to leave some time for Q&A, so write down your questions. Uh, this is going to be live streamed, so just um, if you have friends who couldn't make it, they can watch this conversation uh, later. So with that, we're going to begin. And, and please just um, turn off your phones or cell phones or put them on silence, that would just be wonderful. Um, so let's start by exploring this concept, liberal Zionism. Like, what does this mean, and, and, and what does it encompass? So let me start by asking you, Ehud, if you can talk a little bit. Uh, what do we mean when we talk about liberal Zionism? Great. So first of all, thank you, Michal, for the initiative to convene us. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here tonight, yes, and you. Michael for being part of this conversation. Um, I think that there are two, there are at least two, but I'll use two. Uh, definitions that are, I think are in vogue in Jewish conversation around liberal Zionism and what is what is often talked about as the crisis of liberal Zionism, uh, especially for American Jews. There's one which I think is more common, uh, and I actually think is easier to solve, which is 
how do we hold together uh, liberal values and a commitment to the state of Israel, uh, especially when it appears that the state of Israel doesn't necessarily hold to those values, or at least um, from an electoral standpoint, those values seem to be losing. That feels to me actually uh, a relatively easy uh, piece to solve if we start from the premise that just because a lot of this, just because your um, ideas lose at the ballot, that doesn't mean that they're invalid ideas. Um, that should be easier for liberal and progressive leaning Americans to identify with also. Right? You know, just because your positions lose doesn't mean that they were necessarily wrong. They may need different political strategies, but they're not inherently, uh, they're not inherently flawed just because they've lost in popular opinion. What I think is the more complicated question um, for us to, to sort out is when liberal Zionism is not merely trying to hold together these two sets of commitments, but when it is simply the Jewish expression of, um, of, civ of civic nationalism or liberal nationalism, that is the belief that the nation state is the best guarantor of liberal values, uh, and this is the Jewish version of it, in which we want a nation state for the preservation of the Jewish people, and we want the nation state for the preservation of Jewish values. And the reason why that feels so tested today is number one, because many Israelis are starting to believe that actually liberal nationalism is a worse solution than um, ethnic nationalism, or as opposed to civic nationalism, a commitment to ethnic nationalism as the best guarantor for the survival and safety of the Jewish people. But I think the bigger challenge emerges when Israelis see the nation state as the vehicle not for the preservation of liberal values, but for the preservation of a Judaism that doesn't prioritize liberal values. Uh, and when that becomes the case, it's not merely a question of winning elections, it's wondering whether we're invested in the same project that Israelis are about, or whether we're actually engaged in, a, in trying to preserve a totally different Judaism than the ones that Israelis are trying to preserve. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and Shana, can you say in your own words how you would think about liberal Zionism, especially bringing your expertise in a in, in like the cultural relationship that many uh, American Jews have with Israel? Right, so I think another thing that we have to think about is what we would call labor Zionism, sort of the classic left-wing, center-left, whatever you want to call it, that institution and all the culture that comes along with it, the kibbutzim, the songs, everything, and how that became what most American Jews knew of as Israel. And as those institutions have declined, right, within Israeli society, um, and other expressions of Judaism and Israeliness have risen, that's also part of the issue, right? And, and just to give a concrete example of that, like, this, like, I went to Ramat Palmer in the 90s. I learned Shirei Eretz Israel, like, songs of the land of Israel. Um, I did not know that they were not contemporary Israeli songs. Um, I, until really, graduate school, to be honest. Um, so why it, you know, I, I hope Ramar has changed, I don't, wanna, I don't know what they're doing now, but it says a lot about American Judaism, right, that I learned songs from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s as popular Israeli music, um, in terms of what Americans think of, of what labor Judaism, or excuse me, labor Zionism, and what that, and how that, to some extent, substituted for their knowledge of Israeli society. And it's, it's interesting because I think you heard that you were centering some changes within the, the uh, Israeli uh, public electorate, and Shayna, you were noticing uh, the nostalgia that maybe American Jews have for a different relationship, earlier relationship with right. Israel. Yeah, uh, Michael, can you comment a little bit about what are uh, alternatives? If there's a crisis uh, in, in, in liberal Zionism in America, so what do we see, what are the trends that are showing up, the <laughs> alternative ideologies or commitments that are kind of rising up? Sure. So. I think that in the United States there are definitely uh, a number of different forms of, Zion of Zionism. Liberal Zionism is um, certainly a, a popular one and uh, possibly within the American Jewish community a dominant one. Um, but there is also a very strong strain of religious Zionism, which doesn't necessarily have to be incompatible with liberal Zionism, um, but, but oftentimes is. Uh, and I would say that there is a very strong strain of um, what I'll call Likud Zionism, for, for lack of a better term, because I haven't really thought about it until just now. Um, there's a strong strain of, of Likud Zionism, which really prioritizes the Jewish part of Israel over the democratic part of Israel. And that's not, that's not new either. I think that um, that's been around for a while. 
but it's now been really pushed to the forefront by the current government and that is that is a strain that i think is becoming more popular with some american jews not surprisingly when you have a government in israel that's been around for so long that espouses that form of zionism it's going to come over here to the united states and it's going to have its adherence and i think that at the moment that is the the biggest challenger to what we think of as traditional uh liberal zionism what about in terms of anti-zionism so anti-zionism um that's a you know whole 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 separate whole separate category um yeah there's certainly a, a strain of anti-zionism um in the united states as well i think that uh we're more likely uh just one one person's opinion but i think we're more likely to see non-zionism um take hold in the american jewish community before we see uh, a really strong anti-zionism um, but certainly if you look at a movement like jewish voice for peace that advertises itself as as anti-zionist um it definitely exists um, but you know i don't think that's i don't think that's new either i think that's always been around um it's a little more vocal now but i still think that the the main competitor for liberal zionism in the united states is going to be this Likud zionism and I'm trying to understand a little bit how we got to this moment in which we're talking about a crisis uh, of liberal Zionism. So let me ask you, Shayna, how much do you think the crisis or the feeling of crisis that we have right now is due to what might be called like an aberration in this current political moment of like the Netanyahu Trump uh, alliance and rising political polarization? And how much has this been a destination that we've been, you know, coming slowly towards and maybe not necessarily naming uh, or verbalizing? Right. So as a historian, I love saying that things are older than they appear, because that's my inherent <laughs> bias. So yes, the election of Trump brought things to a head in a way that I don't think anyone could have expected. But I think if you look at shifts, um, especially within Israel, right, the demographics of the Jewish community in Israel and the Jewish community in America are very different. Uh, one of the things, and I think the rise, or the decline of the Labor Party, the decline of the Ashkenazi elite, means that for American Jews, there's a new kind of Israeli that they're not entirely sure what to do with, right? They're not entirely sure to think about Haredi Jews or Russian-speaking Jews or Israeli-Palestinians or Mizrahi Jews because it doesn't map onto the kibbutz that they dreamed about or knew about. So I think those changes have been long coming. I think what's newer, right, and this is, is that you know, Bibi is a master politician, and he's able to test sort of where the wind is going. And in terms of his alliances with um, right-wing nationalist leaders, not just Trump, but in, in Euro especially in Europe, Viktor Orban, the Polish president, etc., those, I think, are really interesting and really complicated alliances that are pretty shocking, even for me. Um, and, you know, I'm just thinking of the statement that Yad Vashem put out against Bibi's um, travels and um, his understanding of the Holocaust law in Poland, uh, I was surprised to see Yad Vashem put out a statement, right? They're not an overly political body. For them to come out against the sitting prime minister is a big deal. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of like shifts and where the wind is going and, and things like that, so let me ask you Yehuda a question. Uh, I think uh, for a long time, uh, liberal Zionists uh, in America uh, drew uh, moral legitimacy for their position by talking about an eventual two-state solution uh, they were working towards. Uh, so what kind of um, moral negotiation do we have to make of a new reality, being that now public consensus in Israel seems to be shifting towards annexation as opposed to a two-state solution? Or like, how can liberal Zionism uh, survive this moment? Well, again, uh, to the extent that, um, that liberal Zionism tied itself into consensus political positions in Israel, and now those positions are minority political positions, that still means that they're alive. It means you have to identify with the politicians who still um, advocate for the positions that you consider to be normative, even if once upon a time that was 40 or 50 percent of the electorate and now it's closer to 10 percent of the electorate. And if you actually believe genuinely that the two-state solution is the strongest guarantor of safety and equality uh, and, um, and morality for both Israelis and Palestinians, then you bear a responsibility to advocate for that outcome regardless of whether it's politically legitimate. Um, the, the problem is, though, that it may be that too much of liberal Zionism for too long has been tied into concrete political representations 
and too little of um, trying to understand the ways in which how we see ourselves as Jews in the American project um, is connected to or different from how Israelis see themselves in the Israeli project. My answer to your question before, Michal, if I can, is um, that you asked, to, you asked to Shana is, I don't think this is even just about ethnicity, who are Israelis, and who have they become, and who are American Jews, and who have we become, or even about political changes, or even about global trends. They are also just stories of <laughs> radically different at for American Jews and Israeli Jews. And we've been thriving and successful. It's, and uh, the way that it works to be an American Jew is to line up American Jews with the nationalist story that America tells about itself. And Israel lives in different climate and different conditions and aligns those stories really differently. So the divergences that we have between our societies, I don't think are merely contingent on what is the right political solution to the resolution of the israel palestinian conflict. They are much bigger dramas of our, um, of, the, of actually the good news of the compatibility between Jewishness and Americanness as Americans have designed it and Jewishness and Israeliness as Israelis have designed it. So you like that? Yeah, can, I, can, I, can I jump in there yeah. for, for a minute to build on that? Um, I think in a lot of ways, liberal Zionism, it, it is an American, it's an American movement, right? You know, we, we talk about how liberal Zionism is dead in Israel. I can't think of a time when liberal Zionism was ever dominant in Israel, or even ascendant in Israel. Um, you know, to Shana's point about, about labor Zionism, Labor Zionism, and, and as Shana, as Shana you know, said, labor, labor Zionism is not the same as liberal Zionism. And you know, if we think of the, the founding government of Israel uh, as liberal Zionists, that's, that's a mistake. They weren't. Um, if we think of the Rabin government as liberal Zionists, that's you know, also, I'd say, I'd say a, tenu a tenuous argument. And so um, you know, liberal Zionism, I think, is, is uh, in a lot of ways you know, alive and well and, and doing great here, even though it's under challenge. Um, but I don't know that it was ever alive and well and doing great in Israel. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. And you know, to Yehuda's point about um, American Judaism, Israeli Judaism, and, and at homeness, um, I think that um, liberal Zionism is always, is always going to be OK here. Um, because you know it does reflect things going on in Israel, but in, in a lot of important ways it doesn't. So I mean, what I'm hearing from a lot uh, in this conversation is that <coughs> perhaps part of the challenge or, or the crisis is that many American Jews convince themselves that part of our liberal Zionism was to find a mirror image uh, in Israel, and maybe some of the difficulty that we're seeing right now is that maybe it's not so. Uh, Maybe it's not so similar. Maybe that we have to actually translate what's going on and actually acknowledge the, the gap um, and the difference. And I think also part of it is acknowledging the differences in understanding and, um, for lack of a better word, tone deafness of sometimes, let's say, with regard to what Michael was bringing up, when I hear liberal American Zionists say, like, you know, pre-67, right, the Zionists were good, the Zionists, you know, you know, it was a liberal society, while like Mizrahi Jews didn't think so, right? Uh, Israeli Arabs under military uh, military government until 1961 didn't think so. So I think also when the association of, you know, if we if American liberal Jews like their partners, so to speak, are the labor Zionists, <laughs> and what the majority of Israeli society thinks about labor Zionists um, is not entirely positive. So then, if they think American Jews affiliate with that, like it's this funny feedback cycle, then they can be really contemptuous of it, even if you know we're not that, so to speak. But I also think that needs to be understood, right? I, you know, I don't love the association of what left wing means in Israeli society. You know, small any, it's the worst thing ever to be left wing. But I think it's impo really important for American Jews to understand where that comes from. That it's not just a political reaction, but it's a sense of deep, deep frustration with the Israeli establishment that controlled Israeli society you know, for the first 30 years of its existence, and those, which, and those after effects of which are still felt today. Yeah, let me ask a question uh, again about why we have different trends or different understandings of at homeness. I'm curious to hear, Michael, what you think about this. Uh, in a recent interview, uh, Michael Oren said, if you look uh, at America, uh, young people are like becoming more liberal, more left-wing, while the industrial military elites are becoming more right-wing. And if you look at Israel, we have like the opposite thing going on, that we have the military and industrial elites uh, either symbolizing liberalism or becoming more liberal, and the young people are becoming more right-wing. 
So can you help translate for us if part of our challenge is that we don't fully understand why we're different or that, that we're different? Uh, can you help explain like th this, this trend? Yeah, um, I'm not going to try to translate Michael. Yeah, no, that's not him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the interview that he, that he uh, hung up on, right? Uh, yes, the, uh, <laughs> the, the transcript is online. It's right. with, uh, um, so, yeah, I, I think part of the problem is that um, I've, I've been on this kick for a while, but uh, you know, Israeli Jews and American Jews like to think of themselves um, as kind of a cohesive peoplehood unit, mm. and I don't think that's the case. I think that um, the way in which Israeli Jews and American Jews conceive of their Jewish identity is entirely different. Their worldviews are entirely different. Um, the way they relate to Israel is entirely different. Um, you know, I think that when I think that when Michael Oren points to a trend here that looks very different from the trends going on there, that that's correct. Um, but it's not just about you know the the elites and the youth and, and what their political leanings are. Um, you know, American American Jews tend to conceive of their Judaism as a set of values. It's a, it's a value system. Israeli Jews tend to conceive of their Judaism as uh, a set of, as, as a religion and as a culture. Um, and it's just a different, completely different conception of, of what Judaism is and what it looks like and, and what its function is. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think he's right in that um, we see very different trends here versus there. I don't know that I would confine it to you know, young people and elites. I think across the board, um, it's vastly different. Right, so I want to hear Yehuda's take on this, especially because uh, Hartman has an institution that has a home both in Israel and in Jerusalem, both in Jerusalem and in New York, in, in America, sorry, uh, <laughs> is dedicated to Jewish peoplehood, uh, which sounds like a bit of a challenge to advocate for a Jewish peoplehood that might uh, uh, collapse some of the differences that seem so important to maintain to not be in this crisis, and also committed to advocating and preaching Jewish values, not only in America, but in Israel as well. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I agree, Michael, with the diagnostic of uh, uh, religion and values versus uh, cult versus the kind of culture, uh, cultural identity you described with respect to Israelis. I actually think uh, both American Jewry and Israeli Jewry. To overgeneralize, obviously, these are these are Jewries that are made up of multiple, of many different communities, uh, are oftentimes actually uh, trafficking in the same set of values and the same um, balances between the extent to which we are a religion, a people, a culture, etc. And perhaps sometimes coming up with what look like radically different permutations, different emphases, uh, but but are using effectively the same raw materials. Um, for instance, uh, there was a poll a couple months ago that said 70% of Israelis are troubled by the conditions that Palestinians live with under occupation. That lines up pretty well with um, with how American Jews understand and think about the occupation. Now, in practice, does that mean that they are going to the ballot booth? to vote for the political parties who are the loudest and most shrill about changing the status quo under occupation? No, because they have a set of other considerations about whether they, they think the, the occupation is resolvable through the political process that American Jews from afar might think is the case. Or another, there was another poll last year that um, was reported in the Jewish media, because sometimes Jewish media likes to take the darkest version of the story. Um, it was reported as said something like 56% of Israelis say American Jews shouldn't have an opinion, um, or that it shouldn't be regarded as a serious opinion of American Jews about internal affairs in Israel. And if you're an optimist, you look at a poll like that and say over 40% of Israelis think they should. And that's actually huge data, because the, over, the, the dominant story is one of divergence. If you said actually 40% of, of Israelis think that American Jews should have, a, should, should have opinions that are worthy of listening to about questions in Israeli society, that means that there's more raw materials there of what's shared than what's different. And I, I think part of why, part of where we get stuck is that we are looking for identical expressions of similar value systems and so, instead of looking at the raw materials. And I think that's part of part of the, the stuckness. Um, I think part of what American liberal Jews have to get comfortable with is the expressions of liberalism that they're going to find in Israeli society are not going to be in the frameworks that American Jews identify or the performances that American Jews actually want of liberal values in Israeli, uh, in Israeli society. So how do you look for the success of your ideas if not exactly in the right, in the political frameworks that you think are the indicators of the success? Thanks. Uh, let me shift a little bit from diagnosing uh, the, the crisis, or, or not crisis, depends where you're sitting here, 
uh, and trying to look at some of the ethical questions that are really coming out of this current moment. Particularly, let's focus a little bit with some of the developments uh, in Israel. Uh, let me start by asking you, Shayna. Uh, so, so how do you um, understand like the moral negotiation that American uh, American Jews who have liberal values uh, have to undergo when there is government after government that doesn't support the sort of religious pluralism uh, that really uh, would make Israel much more of a, of a welcoming home and, and really believe in Jewish peoplehood that came up before. So, and this actually is, goes off of your question, I think one is understanding that what that's going to mean for Israelis is different. So, for example, most Israelis don't really care about the Kotel, right? And, like, we can talk about, I'm not against, you know, they're not necessarily, some of them are, but not necessarily against groups like Women at the Wall or what they're doing, but most Israelis are going to care about Rabbanu, about marriage and divorce, or about places being open on Shabbat, right, or those sort of things. So I think it's taking a step back, looking at what's, going on on the ground, realizing that they might not look exactly what you would want them to look like, um, and empowering those organizations. So I think that's really, really important. But also realizing that it might look different, and it might not look like something right in, um, that we're used to in America. Uh, and I think that's having that a bit of that humility is really, really important, and having the education to understand what's going on on the ground. because. For better or for worse, right? The emphasis on on the kotel really, for most Israeli Jews, is off-putting, and you know makes American Jews seem, to some extent, out of touch. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to push a little bit just to clarify. Does this mean that, uh, as American Jews, so, uh, and those of us who support Israel, visit it, uh, contribute to it, talk of Jewish peoplehood and Zionism, that we have to think about our advocacy demands and beliefs from the point of view of Israeli Jews? Like, wh why do why do I have to ask myself what does religious pluralism look like for Israeli Jews, mm -hmm. and not say actually part of what it means that Israel is, is a state uh, that that can be a, a Jewish home for all Jews is that I get to come here and say you need to make space for my American version of religious pluralism. So I think that I would argue that there are still the difference between people who are citizens and people who are not. I think one of the actually scariest things about the Trump administration, and this comes from the left, and this comes from the right, it's not just the right wing, is this elision, right? There's a lot of reasons why, you know, um, it's, you know, of, of assuming, or assuming all Jews are Israeli citizens, or all Israeli citizens are Jews, or that sort of thing, but I think it's really, really important to remember that difference. I worry a lot that what gets lost in the conversation about Israeli Jew, Israelis and American Jews is Israeli-Palestinians, because guess what, they're Israeli too. Um, so I think that's important to realize, and I think it's important to just to have a sense of, to have a bit of a sense of humility about what these institutions are, and to think, if this doesn't resonate with Israelis, why? Doesn't mean it's wrong, but why? Is the, is the answer because, you know, we take the example of the Kotel, is because it is something that, you know, most, Isra most Israelis see as a place to maybe give your kid a bar mitzvah, and I say bar mitzvah very much on purpose and nothing else, right? Um, or if we want to take a, a different social justice sort of view of it, is it a place that's occupied East Jerusalem, so you can't really have a conversation about the Kotel unless you bring that in? So I think it's important to have that sense of community and understand what's going on in the ground, so you frankly you don't take a, a colonial, I think is too strong of a word, but a, a prescribing or sort of you know coming in with saying, we know what's the best, we know what's going on here. So let's talk about a different problem uh, uh, that the liberal Zionists are grappling with, and I want uh, to address this to Yehuda. Uh, so, so how would you say that American Zionists can avoid being, at best, uh, naive, at worst, complicit uh, in, in, in masking problematic status quo by kind of doubling down on their identity as liberal Zionism and, and a vision of liberal Zionism that's increasingly misaligned with the reality on the ground? Look, one of the things that has made me a little bit more optimistic over the last couple of years is the strength of the alliances between uh, progressive American Jewish activists in, uh, who work on issues in America and progressive Israeli activists on the ground in Israel have strengthened since the Trump election uh, out of a sense of like, okay, help us. We, we both collectively have to figure out what it means to, to, to maintain an ethos both for ourselves as well as how we're received in the public 
as seen as patriotic, committed to the, the goals and ideals of the country in which we're citizens, and to be relentless activists about changing the facts on the ground, convincing hearts and minds, winning elections, etc. One of the reasons that makes me optimistic is because that's essentially what we're talking about. When you don't, if you don't want liberal Jews to be uh, accused of essentially preserving the status quo by talking louder about their quote unquote loyalty to Zionism, um, and as a result, kind of uh, suppressing the the moral urgency of the issues that they have to that they that we want to advocate for, we have to remember that they actually are linked. If the if my liberal Zionism is about arguing that the Jewish people need a nation state as the best guarantor uh, of safety and security for the Jewish people, as well as, um, as well as liberal values that we consider endemic and essential to our Jewishness, we're talking about doubling down. The thing that troubles me most about liberal Zionism in the American Jewish community is we don't actually put our money where our, mouth, where our mouths are. We, American Jews are very angsty about the state of Israel. But the amount of American Jewish resources, philanthropic and otherwise, that actually go towards advancing liberal and progressive values in Israeli society is marginal compared to the amount of philanthropic investment by American Jews towards, um, towards the agendas that are about preserving the status quo or about um, competing with American Jewish values. It's not even close. Uh, and there are reasons in Israel about why those NGOs are struggling, that they struggle to to maintain a presence in the public square, but it's also because I think, and I'm a little uxy about saying this about, about basically me and our own communities, I think we're very anxious about making sure that we don't experience a cognitive dissonance between our Jewish values in America and what we think about Israel, and we're losing kind of, we're losing eye on the prize, which is actually being part of building the version of the state of Israel that, that would resolve that problem. Thank you. Let me, let me push a little bit because you know you give a very optimistic uh, answer and like finding the. I know, I know. No, no, no it's ideologically hard. optimistic. It's, yes, we are. <laughs> Practically, <laughs> extremely pessimistic. <laughs> right. Uh, no, no, but I'm just curious like, uh, is there like a, 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 a limit to that optimism? What, what I mean to say is, would there, could, could you foresee a moment in which the, the reality is so misaligned, or, or before you said, as long as the two state solution is still viable, those who believe in it need to continue advocating for it. So could you foresee a moment in which uh, certain realities on the ground make certain visions so impossible that continuing to have this sort of optimism uh, can actually contribute to maintaining uh, bad realities or making things worse? Um, not really. Um, actually, in most of Jewish history, messianic beliefs about the possibility that the future go up the more your realities get worse. So that uh, messianism, like messianism is the ultimate kind of Jewish optimism, the possibility that their tomorrow will be better than today, even if you kind of have this asymptotic sense that you're reaching towards the limit and never getting there. Like, you can never actually affirm that you're living in a, in a place of the perfect. I don't know why there is a constant fixation with now is the marker that there's the two-state solution is impossible. I don't know. Who said that? Have, you, have we not seen more dramatic historical transformations, even in our lifetimes, of things that were not thought possible? You would have said the same thing about the state of Israel in 1938. Is this actually going to come about? Right. Um, so it's, it seems crazy to me to decide empirically, this event happened, Right. this government was elected, and now that's the death knell for liberal Zionism. No, you just, you work harder. And I don't say that to be, it's not naive optimism. It's just, it's just that's, it's realistic optimism. It's the only way that you could actually envision a, envision a better version of something is to take seriously the obstacles that you face and work towards addressing them. As a, as a policy director of an organization that supports a viable two-state solution, I love that answer. <laughs> It's hard to follow that, but uh, I just want to add that I think um, sometimes these terms pro-Israel, anti-Israel, um, are not always helpful because, like, what does that mean? You know, what are you pro? What are you anti? And I think I said something like this to Yehuda earlier. Um, you know, no matter what, at least, and I'm here. I'm speaking personally, right? No matter what political sea changes we see in Israel, for me, and this is me speaking personally, I have a deep commitment to the place where half of the Jewish population of the world lives. 
Uh, and I think that's really important, and that means having an interest in what happens there, having an interest in their welfare, etc. I think we can learn something from the Haredi world, which it's a messy situation. It's not always clear what these lines are, but um, they have developed a language and um, a commitment to Jews living in Israel, um, while sometimes more than not, not officially embracing Zionism. Right? There's this line from the official English language history of the Agudat Yisrael, of, you know, a, th a thrilling read, um, <laughs> in which um, they say, and it's from the 1970s, they say, Zionism, no. Eretz Yisrael, yes. <laughs> and there's something in that that I actually find, think is really <coughs> compelling, right? Like, they're like, all right, we're not into this system, but this is still really important for us, and we're going to develop a language and a framework. And I think there's something for liberal Jews to, at least liberal Zionist Jews, to learn from there as well. Uh, Michael, I want to turn the question to you, because uh, very often the, the critique uh, of Israel or Zionism is, at the, heart, is at, at the heart of the Jewish state we have a form of ethnic nationalism, that it, uh, that it is at its core uh, not compatible with many of the uh, liberal ideas that we have about what a nation state should be and, and who it should serve. So can you talk a little bit about that, uh, that critique uh, and, and how would you answer it or, or how do you think liberal Zionists uh, can engage with it? So there are plenty of other states in the world that are, that are nation states in the sense that they are formed around, it's a, it's a state formed for a nation, for a specific group. Um, I have no problem with applying Jewish nationalism to Israel and saying that that's a perfectly liberal idea. Jews are the world's most historically persecuted minority, and the notion that they don't deserve uh, a state of their own, they don't deserve national sovereignty, that somehow they have to not have a Jewish state because people want to classify Judaism as an ethnicity. I don't, um, I don't, I don't accept the premise of it. So you know, I think that the one premise of the critique. Correct. I think that one of the things that makes liberal Zionism a powerful idea is that it has a theory of Zionism that demonstrates Zionism to be itself a liberal idea. Um, and if, if giving national sovereignty to, as I said, history's most, most persecuted minority is not a liberal idea, then I, I don't know what is. Um, that is not to say that Zionism in practice has always uh, dealt in the, the, the best manner possible. That's not to say that Zionism in practice has not had its illiberal strains and illiberal moments and illiberal actions. We can, I, I can point to plenty of things that Israeli governments have done, uh, including this one, um, that, are, that are illiberal. But I don't think that that makes Zionism itself uh, an inherently illiberal idea. I think, frankly, it's the opposite. But let me, let me push a little bit a little bit further. Um, mostly about the dissonance, I guess, between the American Jewish story of at-homeness uh, and then some of, not the Zionist idea, but what happens on the ground in terms of the state of Israel. So if, if we think just, for example, about the way that so many uh, uh, Jews uh, advocated for open immigration to America, um, you know, throughout the last uh, uh, century and a half, two centuries or so, or so to, to be a, a refuge for... Jewish people are fleeing persecution and how they, they wouldn't want an immigration policy that only allows certain people to come in. And if you contrast this with the way that you know that Israel uh, privileges Jews uh, over any other group uh, to, to, to be able to immigrate, so, so how, uh, is there a way to kind of live with this uh, multiple narratives without being like uh, ethically <laughs> uh, compromised uh, in kind of supporting both? Yeah, I think that liberalism is not a is not a one size fits all thing, and I think that different structures create their different liberalism. Um, and you know, I think, it's, I think it's okay for Israel to say we want to have one majority Jewish state in the world, and if that means an immigration policy that um, prioritizes Jews over other groups, then I, I think that I think that's okay. And I don't think it means that then you have to take that and say, well, every state in the world should have an immigration policy like that. I think that. Um, different circumstances call for different solutions, and um, I am very comfortable in my liberalism saying that it's fine for Israel to do what it has to do within within reason and within limits to maintain itself as a Jewish state. I also think this is why it's important to de-exceptionalize <coughs> Israel a bit, right, and this is part of my academic agenda, but for example, um, not all countries have birth citizenship, right? Like, we can look at states in Europe. Um, Germany is sort of the biggest example I can think of. 
in which there are third, fourth generation Turkish workers who are not German citizens, right? Um, if we had, and again, this is not to excuse one or the other, but if we understand that there are different models of citizenship and that actually the American model is not the only model um, and that there are things that, you know, they don't exactly like the law of return, but look more similar to it, especially in a European context, we can understand where Israel is coming from. So I think also that knowledge is really, really important, that it's not, that we're not just thinking about Israel, but we're thinking about Israel in the region or Israel in other political um, alliances as well. But isn't this kind of the, this is kind of the crux of the problem, which is um, that it's, it is reasonable for American liberal Zionists um, who are Americans and almost by definition therefore believe in some version of American <laughs> exceptionalism, um, to, it's, it's, it's not unreasonable that American liberal Zionists look at this and say, is the best that you're telling me that like, this is like the Jewish Ireland, right? No, <laughs> wait a second, we have another story of the way in which the liberal state guarantees uh, this, or at least temporarily, um, the, the safety and survival of the Jewish people, and that's not through the ethnic nation state, that's through the American model. Um, that America stands for something that transcends particular uh, ethnicities. That seems to be the crux of the issue, and that's why this feels like an acutely American problem, because this selling point to another generation of Jews of like, I know Israel doesn't look like you think it should, and it's not acting in ways that are consistent with how you think the state is supposed to preserve minority rights, but don't worry, it's just like Germany. <laughs> 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 just, just like, it's like, I'm not sure that that works in the long run. Right, so maybe my issue is with the bit of the American exceptionalism, right? Like I'm thinking of um, you know the famous Margaret Sansani song, like, Pose de la Europa, it's not Europe here. Maybe it should be, it's not America here either. I do think recognizing that difference is, <clears throat> is really important. And, the, uh, and that while liberal American Jews tend to be huge fans of the American narrative and transcending ethnicity and et cetera, for a lot of people in America, that's not what the story is, right? Um, it's not the African American story for sure, right? Michal and I were talking about this earlier today. So I think, again, that bit of humility for understanding that what they think of as a really great system for a lot of people has been really, really damaging. If we want to talk about civic nationalism, right, we can think of, you know, when I, you know, we can think of places that were supposed to be a sort of beacon of civic nationalism, quote unquote, and have turned out to be very, very different, right? France is the obvious example. Um, so I think, again, that sense of humility is really important there. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to you know, build, build on that, um, America may very well be exceptional. Um, Maybe it is, maybe it's not, um, in terms of the Jewish experience. But um, certainly, you know, millennia of Jewish history dictate that um, it's probably a, a bad, a bad idea not to diversify our bets. Um, and so, even if the U.S., you know, a thousand years from now, turns out to be the the exception in Jewish history, um, I think it's probably still a good idea to kind of keep, keep Israel there just in case. <laughs> Uh, right. and it's interesting because I'm hearing like Sam uh, attempt to kind of uh, you know relativize the situation and say well we have to look at you know all these other countries and not necessarily ask ourselves what's the, the morally uh, correct option that Israel should be uh, should be adopting well but I mean that's so even, so here's where here's where I guess where I come out I'm not I, I'm less content with the uh, um, look at other models of ethnic nation states uh, and how they're operating and look, our, so we have one of those two. I'm a little bit less content uh, with that. I'm a little bit more of a pragmatist around the question of why, of why is Israel not more like America? And that has to do with what it would take to make it more like America. And there, I think it is, it is not a liberal or progressive idea to suggest that the amount of um, death, dislocation, and, and social and political trauma that it would require to dismantle the Israeli nation state and replace it with a better version is actually, I don't think that's a liberal or progressive argument. I don't think it actually embodies liberal or progressive values. I do, I do think it's an interesting exercise to ask what might have been the options for the state of Israel to play out its values that we're talking about today until you know, until the creation of the state of Israel in 1948, I think it's worth talking about that because those were the roads not taken. And if we want to be accountable to the decisions that were made previously, and to still hold to our values, 
that too becomes an impetus to let's hold ourselves accountable to these choices, even though there may have been alternatives. I think it's perfectly moral to say, to talk about like the morality of the binational state prior to the state getting created. But I think to say now, I wish it was like America, and therefore I'm gonna dismantle this, um, this project to get there, I think that winds up, that's where, that's kind of a, pra a pragmatic commitment to the ethnic nation state rather than an ideological one. Uh, let me shift a little bit to ask some questions about the, uh, how American liberal Zionists are negotiating their space in progressive liberal spaces mm -hmm. in America. So let me start by asking you, Shana, because I know you work uh, in a college campus. So you know, so many of us read headlines uh, about like w what people tell me, like awful things uh, in terms of, uh, not that I'm agreeing with this, but in terms of uh, uh, anti-Zionist slash, in some cases, anti-Semitic uh, trends on college campuses. So beyond the headlines, what are some of the trends that you're seeing uh, in academia and with the student uh, body in terms of making college campuses uh, uh, spaces where, where, where American Zionists can, can flourish? Uh, and how do you think these trends are going to, uh, are affecting this feeling of crisis uh, in liberal Zionists? So first, anytime you talk about higher education in America, I think it's really important to realize that the vast majority of college students in America are at regional institutions working through their degrees and you know at play, and are older let's say in their late 20s early 30s so while the conversations you know the debates that are happening at places like NYU or Berkeley or UMass Amherst to name a couple of examples are important it's important to remember that they're not representative of the American college experience um, and what gets played and what doesn't is very very important here uh, secondly even on those campuses um, because an event that is anti-Israel, you know, or quote anti-Israel takes place, um, does not necessarily mean that students are affected per se. There was a huge controversy about a conference at Duke about Gaza. We could talk about whether or not it was anti-Israel, it was pro-Israel, whatever. That's another conversation. The vast majority of the student body had no idea it was taking place. So I think that's those are all really important things to remember and think about. I think um, also that. Different sides of you know the political world use the college campus as a way to progress their own agendas and don't think about empowering students. Which gets me to the issue is that I think there has to be the focus has to be on empowering students and empowering them to have the conversations. Where it is difficult, and I've seen this difficulty, is I think a tendency to see all oppressions as the same, right? Um, I think that you know saying that this is like this and like this, and we can't engage with any of it. Um, and anti-normalization and things like that is a real, real challenge. And I think for me, it's more about drawing to ideas of free speech and expression um, and discussion rather than you know, debating the pros and cons of Zionism. I'm thinking of um, what just happened at Williams College in which like a student pro-Israel group was not allowed to be chartered by the student government and the president stepped in um, and let the group be chartered. So I think those are really important. Um, I also think it's really important that these, the intensity that these controversies have often can turn students off and make students really reticent to intervene. Um, so I think it's really, really important that if we see these colleges as a place of breeding the next future generation of leaders, that the um, emphasis has to be on that. Um, I adjuncted at Brooklyn College when I was in graduate school, and there was a, a, I taught history of Zionism, and there was a controversy about a certain apartheid speaker, I don't remember exactly what, I had the president of Hill in my class. Um, I would say standard right-wing orthodox sort of perspective um, in terms of his political views. Um, he, he was working with um, the, the head, he was working with the Hill to try and figure out what to do, they had their own alternative event, etc. cetera. Um, Dov Hyken released a statement saying what the Jews at Brooklyn College should do. Um, the student told me, Dov Hyken did not call the Hillel, did not call any of the um, constituencies, right? He's now gonna remember that for the rest of his life, that Dov Hyken used that to make a, his own game, you know, to make his own earnings, and not to really engage with the students there. And this is coming from someone who's politically maybe not so different than someone like Dov Hyken. So I think those things are really, really important, and to remember the context um, in which these conversations are taking place, I think they can sometimes be a tempest in a teapot. Uh, Yehuda, let me ask you a little bit about the, the complicated <coughs> negotiation of political alliances. 
Uh, and I get, I get the sense, you know, from reading different headlines that often uh, alliances that would otherwise be good uh, for, for liberal values or Jewish values kind of like get shut down uh, because of some of these tensions that we've spoken about before. And sometimes alliances that we might say are not the best are, are, are kind of uh, advanced uh, for similar reasons. Uh, so how do you understand some of what's going on in terms of, of alliance making? Uh, and what would you say can be um, uh, an ethical or, or moral formula that can actually help uh, organizations and individuals in the Jewish community uh, negotiate these complex commitments uh, in, you know, with all of these alliances? So I, I look. I think one. I think the thing that has gone wrong around Jewish alliance building in America has been a larger culture of purity politics uh, around Israel, around Zionism, around commitment to values, which is so strange because so much of Jewish history around um, around Jewish politics, uh, and in fact, so much of the American Jewish experience has thrived precisely because the people involved in creating alliances. Um, knew exactly who they were talking to, and looked out for the were looking out for the best interest of the Jewish people, and were therefore willing to construct alliances with even people who they felt were not act were were their enemies. And in fact, there's almost no argument for alliance building with people who are already your allies. Uh, there's so something weird happened uh, around um, around the purity the purity testing. Of, um, of allies and alliances. Some of it has to do with the indelibility of, um, of modern media, so that uh, anytime someone is, you have a snapped a photo of somebody in some context, that stays forever. And as opposed to being a provisional moment, um, we interpret anyone who's friends with anybody else to, 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 be, um, to be stained by their politics. I think the Jewish community has been terribly complicit in this for reasons that Shana alluded to before in terms of the way that we have promoted our own existential threats against us and turned them into actual existential threats. The, you know, the money statistic on this, the coverage of the BDS movement in Jewish media is 400 to one of coverage in regular media. So it, it's like you've, essentially Jewish community created its own, its own boogeyman uh, and turned it into something that um, the BDS movement wishes it was as successful as it is imagined in the Jewish community, um, in community rhetoric. And the more that that happens, the more that it feeds the same purity politics. Anyone who touches this um, winds up being complicit in it. I think one of the charges for us as members of the Jewish community is to be much more discerning and much more skeptical about the ways in which um, political voices are trying to tear down their opponents, um, to be really uh, much more critical readers of, the way of, the, of those purity tests, uh, to challenge our institutions, to not create litmus tests for who we talk to, if you can only talk to people who you already agree with, you will achieve nothing. You won't learn anything, and you won't influence them. Um, and um, and I don't know all of the reasons why we've come up with these kind of um, pure politics. It just seems like so at odds with the Jewish historical experience of politics, and such a frivolous way to think about our own moral character that we're supposed to be um, that we're supposed to be entirely pure, not just in what we hold to, but in who we talk to. And let me ask uh, Michael a question about alliances as well. So part of, I think, the challenge, uh, let's say, when there's a, a politician who says things that are uh, anti-Israel or anti-Zionist and that many liberal Zionists would find problematic, part of the challenge is that often the loudest voices uh, criticizing uh, those statements are from individuals across the partisan aisle who tend to cynically <laughs> uh, use these moments for their own political gain. So especially in this, is this age in which like, America is so politically polarized, uh, how, how, how can uh, individuals negotiate uh, both their commitments to a certain version of American politics and to what they hope civil society in America look like, and at the same time be able to engage in having moral courage to speak up when there's the problematic types of, of anti-Israel or anti-Zionist statements? So I would hope that everybody would, um, would always choose the, the moral courage option, um, even though it's, it's difficult. I think that, yes, we're, we're certainly, we're in this tribal moment, right? And, and people, um, they stick with their political tribe, and it doesn't matter you know, what, what gets said and what gets done. Um, that seems to be people's first allegiance. And um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a good thing for our discourse. It's not a good thing for our politics. I don't think it's going to be a good thing ultimately for the Jewish community. And I think that um, we should all be willing to call out problematic statements when they happen, no matter who says them. And I think that we should also all be willing 
to um, to to call out the the pylon um, when politicians say something that actually isn't problematic, but that gets weaponized by the politician on the other side. Um, it shouldn't be that just because Donald Trump says something, it's automatically bad. It's often automatically bad, but, <laughs> but, but not always. Um, and by the same token, you know, just because uh, Rashida Tlaib or, Il or Ilhan Omar says something about Israel or Jews, sometimes those things are deeply problematic, and sometimes they're not. Um, and I think that, you know, as uh, as American Jews, we're going to all be left off in a very bad, uncomfortable situation if we simply further the usage of our community as a political football and as a political cudgel that we can, you know, the politicians can use to uh, hit other people over the head with. Um, I think we should do a much better job uh, of evaluating statements based on what the actual statement is versus who said it. So I want to thank so much our panelists uh, for the answers to all these uh, challenging questions. And I want to open up to a Q&A. And let me just, uh, let me, I just want to remind everyone uh, how the Q&A is going to work. Uh, so just to remind you, let's ask questions, uh, no comments or stories with uh, what do you think at the end, just like, you know, <laughs> substantive questions. Uh, I also want to remind you that we're being uh, live streamed, so your question might be cut there, and just please say your name, but if you want to be anonymous, then maybe don't ask a question. Um, uh, and, and yeah, well, I'll take a, a couple of questions, and we have uh, Naomi with a microphone, and we're going to approach audience members. So we'll take a couple of questions, our panelists will respond, and then we'll hopefully have time uh, for a couple uh, more. So I'm going to start with this side of the room. Uh, so um, the two individuals over here. Yeah, I'll just say your name, and if you can stand up. Or you may call any time. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ali. Um, thank you so much for speaking. And it's a topic that I'm not ordinarily comfortable, uh, uh, we'll get to the question, not ordinarily comfortable hearing because I may fall on the opposite side of the spectrum, so it's great to hear it. Uh, in response and in question to the conversation about higher education and people not being aware necessarily of the Gaza Conference or of the fact that SJP won an award, et cetera, how do you recommend that we as the Zionist, wherever you fall on the spectrum, we as the Zionist community maybe um, utilize free speech to enable other people to understand it's not okay to have that kind of conference in the first place? So, Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let me take one more question and then and anybody, and the gentleman over here. Yeah. Just close questions without the answer? Or? Yeah, just ask your question and then you guys get okay. to Sure. Uh, hi. My question is, how can, how can liberal Zionism improve its education of young people? Um, because I, I personally, as someone who was raised by liberal Zionists and in liberal Zionist institutions, there was a tremendous amount that I wasn't taught, and I feel like that's something that has really infuriated and animated a lot of um, activism in recent years, and I'd love to know what you think about how that can be improved. Um, so just with the higher education, um, <laughs> I think it's really important that we think about how we use our power. Um, there, is a there is a hunger crisis on college campus. There is a mental health crisis on college campuses. So just to remember that. And again, I would think it's, all, it's about local um, community groups. So let's take what happened at UMass Amherst. Again, I'm not convinced that these things are necessarily shouldn't happen, um, but calling the local departments, calling local Hillel's, right? Not issuing public statements, not issuing, uh, or not sorry, not issuing public statements, but not um, taking the time to what's going on. Um, social media, et cetera, means that everything, we see everything all the time, and we don't necessarily take the time to learn the local context. So I think that's really, really important. Um, and not using the bludgeon every single time, because it's not necessarily the same. Um, for example, the Gaza conference, I don't necessarily think it was perfect, but I'll just state this perfectly, I did not have an issue with the program. I'll say this, I would not, not necessarily agree with every single person there, but I think it was important conversations and an important topic. Um, so I think that's just really important to keep in mind, um, to not paint all of this in the same sort of light. I think, um, so that we can save our concern for something like when, for example, and. Um, a certain department at NYU, my PhD alma mater, decides to cut off ties with um, NYU Tel Aviv, right? That's, I think, for something that calls for, at least in my eyes, pulling out all the stops. 
Um, so I think we have to be to pick our battles and to be judicious about that as well. I think the second question, to my mind, is connected to the first in that one of them, one of them is seek, and as I see it, seeks a positive solution in, in response to what is currently a negative strategy in the Jewish community around Israel. The overwhelming majority of Israel education, um, and I, I love this question, thank you for asking it here. Um, the overwhelming majority, I think, of Israel education is essentially inoculative. Uh, it thinks of its job as to be able to combat, uh, to combat the delegitimization of Israel. And by definition, when you think in education in terms of those terms, um, fighting against the enemies, weaponizing college students to be soldiers in a battle, what that will do is it'll make you make all sorts of terrible educational choices. The minute that you're curating content because it's inconvenient, the more that you're trying to create content in order to prevent people from coming to wrong conclusions, you're not doing Jewish education anymore, you're doing advocacy, there may be a place for that as a feature of a, of a community's tapestry of organizations and institutions, but it's certainly not the same as education. Uh, Israel education is the only piece of Jewish education uh, where the same disciplines that are thought to be incredibly valuable in Jewish education are thought to be dangerous in Israel education. For instance, when you teach Tanakh, you teach Bible, you teach Talmud, um, anyone who's taught knows this, the best thing that could happen in a classroom are the unpredictable things, that a student asks you a question that you can't answer, or comes up with a reading of a text that you hadn't thought of, stumps you, um, where students get into a great argument about the text. And somehow, when it comes to Israel education, we expect that we're actually supposed to curate a set of information which will translate into at least a baseline set of political <coughs> commitments and convictions, and our students see through it. They've seen through it in studies around Jewish education where they're skeptical of what their institutions have taught them. And, I, and the irony, of course, is for a community that cares this deeply about this topic uh, of Israel, why would you use the, the, the methodologies that are more likely to cultivate suspicion? If you're this confident, and I think we are as a community confident about the centrality of Israel to what it means to be a Jew, we should teach it confidently, which means a vulnerability to, um, to questions for which we don't have an answer, a recognition that our people are struggling with what does nationalism mean, or just in, in summary, if you can't have this kind of conversation, why is nationalism hard for the Jewish people in a day school, in a camp, somewhere else, um, then, then you don't know the answers to the questions. <laughs> and then you have to study it yourself to go back into the education business. If you're scared to have this type of, of encounter with ideas, then there's a flaw in the very Zionism that you're trying to educate for. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I, I was just, one sentence, uh, two sentences, which is, which is that, yeah, I think, I think the marketplace of ideas, the best ideas win out. And if you're confident in your Zionism, you're confident in, uh, in the fact that Israel is a, is a, a just and, and moral cause, then you shouldn't be afraid of having a conversation. Let's take two questions from this side of the room. Uh, so uh, maybe over here and over here. Thank you, I'm Rabbi Zavikovic, Baruch. Um, I want to ask you, if Benin, no Benin, excuse me, <laughs> if Ben Gurion and Rabin and all those who really were there in 1948 and made the kibbutzim, they are not, they are not like a role model for liberal Zionism. After them or before them, who? I mean, I don't, I don't see who is the model or, or what I can learn about liberal Zionism. The second question is more uh, <clears throat> politically incorrect one, which is, would you, not you now, it's for the panel, do you think that Zionism is out of the Jewish community in terms of education? The Sunday school, by, by the way, sent the wrong message. <laughs> Jewish education is not the first priority in our home, it's the second, because the public school is the first one. Don't you think that Zionism is it's not taught as it should, it should be like part of the commitment, the same commitment as the children learn about to having the Sidur and prepare for the Bar Mitzvah. Okay, we'll take one more question over here. Okay. Hi, my name is Laura. You, you touched a little bit on this rift that exists between the ideologies of the Israeli and American <coughs> Jewish communities, but you didn't really touch on whether or not that rift is an issue for whether there exists a global Jewish community or not. 
Um, whether that's a problem for the global Jewish community or whether it is kind of just distancing <coughs> American Jews from life in Israel, I'd, I'd just be curious to hear more about whether that rift is actually a bad thing or not. Sure, so, um, so don't get me wrong, I think that you know, Ben Gurion and Rabin are uh, enormous role models. I'm not sure that they are um, role models of liberal Zionism. Um, you know, so who? I mean, uh, let, let's just take people who are you know around around right now, uh, or or sort of in the very recent past. Um, there are still liberal Zionists in Israel who are in the Knesset. Um, if you look at most of the Labor Party, if you look at Stav Shapiro, if you look at Itzik Shmuley, they are liberal Zionists. Um, I know uh, Yehuda at one point worked for worked for Yossi Berlin, right? Um, Yossi Berlin, you know, was was working in a in a government that I'm not sure. Uh, I would, that the Prime Minister is a liberal Zionist, but Yossi Bailin is certainly a liberal Zionist. Um, they do exist, but I think that oftentimes we mistake Labour Prime Minister for liberal Zionist, and, and those two things are not uh, are not necessarily uh, coterminous. I, I guess I'll respond to the question of is the the, the, the question of the distancing hypothesis is this a bad thing <coughs> um, for for the Jewish people for the Jewish community? I don't know. Um, I, I don't, first of all, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced about the whole distancing hypothesis. Ninety plus percentage of American Jews think that a relationship with Israel is a meaningful feature of, of being a Jew in America. That's pretty good. That's up there with like Holocaust and and food. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, so I, I think uh, I think I think there are two phenomena that get that get conflated a lot. One is uh, Israel is a source of tremendous conflict for the small percentage of hyper-engaged American Jews. It's the biggest source of conflict inside the American Jewish community, but I don't see a, a, huge, um, a huge exodus of the American Jewish community from thinking Israel is important to them because of occupation, religious pluralism, et cetera. I think the bigger risk, and this goes to your question before, is that Judaism is less of interest to American Jews than it was in a previous generation, and Israel is like a tough sell. Um, if I'm already trying to convince somebody to be connected to their Judaism, then Israel is like a um, like a hyper difficult version of that because it's seven thousand miles away. It's in a different language, a different cultural idiom, uh, etc. Um, again, it goes back to the question of education, and I think I think the fact that something is exotic and weird and sometimes alienating is are actually assets in a, in a good educational system. Um, I think I think you know, Shana, you alluded earlier to. American Jews doing Israel education based on a version of Israel that really worked for American Jews, like Senna. Yeah. Senna was great for American Jews. It's a great dance, not a lot of words. Um, uh, totally ridiculous words that if anyone ever understood what they were. They totally sexist. Um, totally. But, um, um, but so like we kept, we held on to that for a long time as though that makes a better case than the wild uh, kind of cultural production that, it, that the state of Israel is about today. What you have to be willing to do in that kind of education is open up the possibility that people will encounter the exotic and not like it. <laughs> That's a risk, of, again, of serious education. Oh, wow, I'm looking at this seriously, language, culture, and it's too hard for me to assimilate to my notions of my Jewishness, but at least you have a fighting chance for, um, for a person to be able to say, I'm part of this larger Jewish conversation and there's something here that I can participate in, learn from, assimilate into my Jewishness, and I don't see enough of that uh, underway in, in Jewish education. Um, I mean, I'll just make a plug for, I mean, this is the bread and butter of what I do, is um, engagement with Israeli cultural production. And that can take any form. It can be television, dance, theater, et cetera. Um, it's hard to access more minority groups because it gets translated less, both literally and um, figuratively. Um, but what is going on in the Israeli cultural scene is fascinating, complicated, and really is such, I think, a powerful avenue for education. So go watch Israeli TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll just add, as someone who lived in a, in a bunch of countries and, and learned different languages, the first thing that you have to realize when you move to a new space is that you're speaking different languages. If you kind of continue assuming that you're talking the same language and you're not, then everything is lost. Uh, so before translation has to happen, the gap needs to be acknowledged. Uh, let's take a couple of questions. Uh, all the way in the back, uh, or, or yes, please. My name is Josh. Thank you, everybody. I just had a question about, um, I guess, specifically the sort of the the arguments 
with what to do with the West Bank from a moral argument as opposed to a strategic argument. Is there any thought, it, it seems like a lot of the stuff comes from we're uncomfortable with what the Israeli army or Israel is doing in our name, uh, but not a sense of what happens if they were to be removed and what that new state looks like. Because if you have trouble with religious freedom in Israel currently, wait till you see the West Bank under Arab rule. So my question is, how much of it is a desire for people who are uncomfortable with things to remove their agency, but not necessarily a thought of what does that new state look like? How does that new state align and sort of things that we're advocating for, where do they lead to? Um, when you have people on the left who I would call hijackers of the left, like Linda Sarsour saying you can't both be a feminist and a Zionist, is it fair to say, or this is my hypothesis, that within the purview of this amalgamation of liberal Zionism, that the crisis is really with liberalism and not with Zionism? That, that is to say that you know, this, the word nationalist has now become charged, whereas it wasn't really before at the founding of the state, or even going back to the Torah, if you want to say the mandate from God was that Jews should be a nation, um, goy or kiddushin. Um, not like Israeli, um, and so that, that's the question, is, is the crisis really with liberalism and avoiding the hijacking thereof versus with liberal Zionism? I'll, I'll take that first one. Um, so I think actually uh, you know, a lot of time is spent thinking about what that state would look like um, you know, if there were to be a, a two-state solution. Um, I, I'd commend you to go check out IsraelPolicyForum.org, where, uh, <laughs> where, we, where we, write about, write about, we write about it a lot. Um, but you know, what I would say is that you know, I think it's important, you know, if we're ever going to get to a deal between Israelis and Palestinians for a Palestinian state in the West Bank, it's going to have to have some sort of provisions for the things we're talking about. It's going to have to have some sort of provision for Jews to be able to visit uh, Kever Rachel, to uh, visit uh, Yosef's tomb in, in Nablus. That, that stuff is going to have to be in there, and um, it's been it's been part of negotiations in the past, and um, I see no reason to assume that it won't be. But um, I also think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of times we have views of what religious liberty looks like inside of Israel that, that aren't true. Um, you know, for for all the talk of um, you know. What, God forbid, what would happen if Palestinians control the Temple Mount? Right now, if you are a West Bank Palestinian and you're Muslim and you're uh, a male over the age of 50, um, you are never allowed into Al-Aqsa unless it's Ramadan. Um, if you are a Christian living in the West Bank um, and you want to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, you're lucky if you get a permit to go once a year. So, you know, these problems exist on both sides. I think what's important is to make sure that in any agreement, religious rights are protected for everybody in, in both states. Um, I also think it's really important that, at least, and I'm speaking personally, I don't believe in any sense of a moral occupation. Um, I think the idea of like, well, we're doing it better than they would is an argument that I don't find compelling at all. Um, we can talk a lot about the effect it has on everyday Palestinian life. Um, there's a lot of testimonies to, to speak about that. Um, but I also think it's important to think about the effect it has on, the, on our own culture, whether that's Jewish culture, Israeli culture. Um, David Grossman's essays on this have been incredibly influential for me um, in, in thinking about this as well. And to think that we're just doing this strategically and it doesn't have any moral effect on us is, uh, I think, wrong and doesn't acknowledge the reality of what's going on there. Go okay, to the second question. Um, no, I don't think that because uh, one or one or five progressive activists claims that they don't want um, a Jewish commitment to nationalism and Zionism to be in relationship to their understanding of progressive and liberal values, I'm not willing to concede on the basis of what they think <laughs> that I have to now abandon the core of my commitments that have been sustained for a long period of time, which have a lot more, have, as you can see, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of depth and commitment that go into those values. Um, I think that's actually, that argument, since some progressives claim that Zionists can't be progressive spaces, that proves that progressivism is wrong, is only a self-affirmation, it's only a self-affirming position for those who are already anti-progressive. 
That's, that's, that's pretty much what it is. I think the liberal and progressive Jewish community has done a huge favor to anti-progressives by even engaging in that conversation because it is basically a means of affirming a political narrative that its adherents want to win. Um, I think it's it's I think it's reasonable to push back against those ideas. I think one of the ways that I admire how progressives do this is by staying in those spaces in spite of the people who want to push them out. Whether or not you have to perform that with your Zionism on your sleeve or not, I think is is an open question. Um, but I don't I don't think that the way that you articulate your own identity is by capitulating to those who are trying to sever your identity from you. It doesn't make sense. Around the question, so over here, and then over here, and the next was Sheila. Hi, um, I'm Rob Soliger, and um, um, I I'm as upset as just about everybody else is over what's been going on in Israel at least the last 10 years. And um, if I were around in the 1940s, I probably <coughs> would have been a Zionist who favored by nationalism. But we know, you know, the Arabs did not accept binationalism. They didn't accept any kind of solution that was uh, realistic for, for the issue. And uh, somehow I think that both sides have a talent uh, for not missing an opportunity to miss an opportunity. I'm just going to ask that we That's really true of both sides. So my question is, how do we process their bad behavior with our bad behavior? How does that affect our liberal Zionism? Thank you. Uh, my name is Jessica Brown. Uh, I think we all appreciate the power of messaging and language. And to me, it seems that Zionism has become a dirty word. And we all know that liberal Zionism is, is far from it. But what do you all think we can do to try to turn the connotation of Zionism to, to make people understand that not all Zionists are Sheldon Adelson or the ZOA? And that just because it's our last round, we're going to take this one last question over there. And, and feel free to add any closing remarks. Maybe this isn't a good closing question. I'm not full. Um, this is more of a kasha, I think, because <laughs> I'm curious if any of you on the panel want to provide what you might think is a working definition of liberal Zionism, because I don't know what that is. <laughs> right. That's a great uh, <laughs> Yeah, I would say first of all, most Jews weren't binationalists either, so that's not so that's important to keep in mind. Um, I think critique starts at home. Um, I think you know there's a lot. I mean, we could adjudicate every part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and think about assigning blame, but I believe similar to what I was saying earlier about thinking about local communities and whatnot. I think uh, getting your own house in order. Um, it needs to be a priority, and to me, I think, is the most um, genuine way of doing things. Um, so I think in terms of priorities, that's what I would think about. Um, and that can mean different things for different people, um, but I think that has to be a priority for the Jewish community. I think it would be disingenuous um, if it were only aimed at, you know, sort of Arab society or Palestinian society or what have you. So um, I, I, just, I said at the outset that my, what I think the more challenging definition of liberal Zionism that, that I wanted to work with was around um, essentially a Jewish version of, of liberal nationalism, the, the belief that the nation state is the best vehicle to ensure liberal values, and that for a whole variety of reasons there's a Jewish version of that which connects to both Jewish vulnerabilities and the belief that these liberal values are connected to our Jewishness. So that's how I'm um, processing that term. I, I think to your question about 47, 48, I think one of the lost miracles of the Jewish, of the relatively recent Jewish past, was the was the state of Israel's embrace of the partition plan. Uh, and part of the reason I find that to be a lost miracle is because it it certainly was not perfect, and it's not what most Zionists who were even uh, aspiring for a nation state at the time wanted. Uh, in other words, the state of the, the the Jewish leadership had to accept a deeply inferior version of what they thought was going to be in the best interest of the Jewish people. I think 67 has gotten into our collective heads, and I mean this on the right and on the left, with the belief in messianic solutions. For the right, the messianism is one of, um, of kind of total conquest, and for the left, it's the messianism of believing that the circumstances are so broken that we need radical overhaul. 
I, I, I love the Zionism of 48 to 67, because it's the Zionism of embracing the imperfect. And I think part of what we have to kind of get back to is, um, is that kind of prosaic Zionism, right? I think that's actually hard for American exceptionalist Jews, it's hard for liberal Jews to be comfortable with um, to be comfortable with a Zionism in which we recognize that the perfect is the enemy of the good. But I think that's at the core of what actually builds the state of Israel uh, and one that, that's going to sustain it. And as it comes, and as it relates to the Palestinians um, and what, what they did wrong, I think it's an important question for negotiations uh, and it's an important question for the future of Israel, uh, the, 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 the resolution of the conflict. It's not a hugely important question when it comes to evaluating the moral character of the Jewish people. The moral character of the Jewish people is not defined by other people's actions. It has to do with what we hold ourselves as being committed to. Um, and the more that you exonerate your moral actions on the basis of what other people did, you're not really talking about morality anymore, you're talking about realpolitik. And the extent that liberal Zionism is about um, the articulation of a, of a political framework to ensure of what we want for the world, then that has to do entirely with the decisions that we make and not the decisions made by others. Yeah, um, one of the things that drives me craziest is when people uh, respond to criticism of Israel by saying, oh, well, Israel did X, but you know what they do in, in China? Do you know what they do in Saudi Arabia? If that's if that's who we want to be compared to, then you know I, to to Yehuda's point, I think I think we're going down a we're going down a very a very bad path. Um, Yair Rosenberg um, makes this point uh, often and effectively that if you want to uh, if you want to actually change change anything, get see anything get done, the people you should be talking to are the ones on your own side, right? Those are the ones who are uh, going to be the most open to your criticism, right? The folks on the other side. You know, if you're criticizing them, well, okay, you know, you're, you're, you're their opponents, they're not going to listen. But when you criticize your own side, you actually have a chance of changing behavior, and I think that, um, I think that, that, that applies here. So the question of, um, you know, reclaiming the word, the word Zionism, um, I think that it's important for, for us to wear that moniker proudly, um, to not shy away from it, to not try to come up with, you know, a, a term that is going to be um, less loaded or, or less offensive or um, you know, not have certain connotations. I think that we should be proud of what Zionism is and I think that the response should be to, to wear, it, wear it like a badge of honor and explain to people what Zionism is and what Zionism is not. I think that's the only way to, um, to stop it from becoming a dirty word. I think if we abandon it, then you know, we, we, we have sealed its fate. Thank you. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Hannah Comer, Michael Grammer, Dina Weiler, Sabra Waxman, Naomi Adlin, and Dan Friedman for putting together this, uh, for really helping put together uh, tonight's event. And thank you to our panelists for really uh, taking on the in your seats advertising an upcoming event, and I just want to give a plug in for that. Uh, this coming, th not this Thursday, next Thursday, June 6th, we're having a fascinating conversation between uh, Shell Maggie and Christine Hayes, uh, focused on the publication of uh, Shell's uh, new book. Uh, so there's further information here. Thank you so much, and have a great night.